the third part of my message on Pregnant with Promise. How many of you remember the first uh, lady, the first woman that was barren, and we studied her life two Sundays ago? Sarah. Sarah was the wife of Abram, and Sarah could not have children, and God blessed her with Isaac. Last Sunday, we studied the second one, Pregnant with a Promise. Who was it? Isabel. Isabel, the wife of? Elizabeth. Thank you. I was just checking if you're paying attention. <laughs> Elizabeth was the wife of Zechariah. And Zechariah was a priest in the temple of the Lord in Israel, in Jerusalem. And he was uh, in duty to present sacrifices to the Lord passing by the Holy of Holies, passing by the veil of the temple. And in there, in the Holy of Holies, he had a vision, um, actually a visitation of an angel appeared to him and told him he would, him and his wife would have a son. And Zechariah doubted and said to the angel, how can I know this is true, what you're telling me? And uh, we see that Gabriel was the angel that was sent by God. And Gabriel was not very patient with Zechariah's doubt and said to him, you're going to be, because you didn't believe, you're going to be mute until the baby is born. And from that day on, for nine months, Zechariah could not speak. He, everything he wanted to say he had to write in a little tablet. But then when the baby was born, everybody praised God for healing um, Elizabeth of her barrenness. And she had a baby, and finally he could speak again. And the first words out of his mouth were praises to the Lord. And today we're going to study the most important um, figure in the whole, the whole Bible, I believe, of course, apart from Jesus himself, which is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she also uh, received a visitation from the same angel, Gabriel. It seems that he came to visit um, Zechariah to announce the birth of John the Baptist. And in the book of Luke, the next story is how he went, the same angel, went to visit Mary and said to Mary, you are going to bear the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We're going to study that today. And what it's interesting to me in that story uh, is that Mary reacted to the angel's announcement of her being pregnant with a promise, the promised one, the Messiah. Her reaction was one of belief, agreement, and surrender. Believe, agree, and surrender. Can we say those three words together? Believe, agree, and surrender. Say that again with me. Believe, agree, and surrender. She, you know, we could spend the day here talking about Mary's reaction to the angel's announcement, but I just want to focus on these three factors. Believe, agree, and surrender. And the first point is believe. I want to share with you Luke chapter 1, verse 34 to 38. And see if we can read that together. Let's go. Then the angel said to her, Do not marry, for you have with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a, and shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne. Come on, everybody. And he will reign over the of Jacob and his kingdom. And let's try to read together. I know that some of you can read real fast, but when we read together, let's wait for, for everybody to read together, okay? And Mary said to the angel, since the pay attention to Mary's answer there. How will this be? Okay, let's go on. And the angel I have this slide here I want to uh, read for you. Mary's question to the angel, how will this be, is not based in doubt. As Zechariah's question, how can I be sure of this? So you see here you have the two questions. The same angel brings a similar message to Zechariah and to Mary. Mary says, how will this be? 
She's not doubting. She just wants to know how it's going to happen. She knows it's going to happen. It's just a matter of how because she's a virgin and she's not married. And she was a devout um, Jewish girl who loved God and followed the law of Moses. And so she's thinking, okay, how am I going to have a baby if I'm not married? How, how will this be? It's not based in doubt. Now, Zechariah's question is based in doubt. He says, how can I be sure of this? See the difference there? How will this be? How can I be sure? If he asks, how can I be sure, that means that he is not? Sure. sure. Right? How can I be sure? That means he is not? Sure. How can I become sure? I'm not sure. So that's the wrong thing. Thing to say if you're ever visited by Gabriel, be warned. <laughs> if you're ever visited by an angel and he tells you something's going to happen, don't doubt what the angel is saying because you don't want to happen to you what happened to Zechariah. And the angel said to Zechariah, because I didn't believe, you're going to go mute. You're not going to speak until the baby's born. Imagine how your life would be if right now you went mute, can't speak. <laughs> How would that be? Would it make your life easier or more difficult? It's Monday morning, you have to go to work. You know? You want to tell your wife you want breakfast? You got to text her. Right? And then you go to work, and you meet your, your boss. And, and I can't speak. I have no. Go to the doctor. Take a few days off. Take a, a short leave, go check out your, your throat, and you go to every, doc, every doctor in town and, and out of town, and they all said, I don't know what's going on. They said, Everything is fine with your vocal cords. There's no reason you can't speak. <laughs> and you try to explain the angel. Imagine that situation. That would be fun to watch. Well, it wasn't fun for Zechariah. He couldn't speak. He didn't have a cell phone to text anybody. So he had to get a little tablet and write. And there was no chalk and chalkboard at the time. This is a later invention, you know. So I wonder what kind of tablet he had, what kind of instrument he used to write on. It must have been hard. Um, in those days, they did have pen uh, and ink. Um, but for something like a little tablet where you can write and erase, they had uh, a certain type of tablet that was made of clay. It was a solid back of wood in the back and soft clay on the top. And you would write, because Hebrew letters are little sticks, right? The stick figures. So they would, that's what the scholar said, he probably had one of those clay tablets. And to, to erase, you would just, just spread the clay around. It was not mud, it was like clay. It was not solid, but it was firm enough that you could write a word or two, you know, a few words in it. Anyways, imagine having a tablet of clay to write stuff. You know, nowadays we have iPads, we have iPhones, we have all this stuff, you know. But he didn't have any of that. And that was a consequence of his disbelief. We, we, we tend to think of, uh, and I hear a lot of people say, and I don't want to get into it, but a lot of times when people are studying the Bible and they, they're deciding if they want to be Christians or not, it, even Christians themselves sometimes have a hard time comparing or understanding the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. It, it, it sometimes for unbelieving people or for even some Christians, they think, well, it seems to be a, two different gods, Right? The God that burns down Sodom and Gomorrah doesn't seem to be the God that comes in the person of Jesus. In other words, it's hard to imagine Jesus burning down a town, right? But that's what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. And a lot of times, even Christians have a hard time understanding. And I had, I had a very smart guy come to me once. I, he said, I read the entire Bible. I'm a Christian, though I'm not a practicing Christian. I believe in Christ. He says, but my theory is God learned. God evolved as he dealt with humanity. 
because you see the God of the Old Testament being so harsh, and then you see the God of the New Testament being so kind. All he talks about is love, and there's no judgment. So my conclusion is, God changed. And I said to him, hmm, very interesting. You are basing all, you are basing this idea that God changed in the fact that you see God dealing with people differently in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, the God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament seem to be apparently, and I understand when you, what you're saying, apparently seem to be very, very different, like polar opposites. But there's so much evidence in the Bible that God doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's so many Bible verses that talk about the nature of God being perfect. If something is perfect, don't touch it, right? You can't, like, how many of you agree with me that nobody should go to the Mona Lisa and say, I'm just going to do a few touches here to make it better. <laughs> so, you know, give, if anybody gave you a brush, would you say, I'm just going to give you a few touches to make it better? No. You don't go to a Monet or a Picasso and say, I'm just going to give a little, it's, it's just missing some color here. You don't touch it, right? It's perfect the way it is. And then let's think of nature, you know. Well, you know, there's this animal here, let's say the chicken. Oh, you know, the chicken doesn't need wings, right? It doesn't fly. No, oh, but we eat the wings. Oh, so it eats, okay, so we it need, don't touch the wings, we need the wings. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Leave them. <laughs> well, well, we, we should, so if you like the wings so much, maybe we could make chickens that are born with four wings <laughs> instead of two, right? So we can have more wings per chicken. You know what? It's perfect the way it is. Don't touch it. There's nothing in nature that you can look and say, this could be better. Like, could the oceans be better? Could the sun be better? Did you know that if the sun was any closer to the earth, we would be scorched? There would be no life on earth. Everything would be burned. And if the sun was just a little degree further, there, was, there would be no life because everywhere would be frozen. So the sun is in a perfect position to sustain life on the earth. Isn't that amazing? Everything on, in creation is just perfect. Now, creation points to the creator because when you look at Mona Lisa or when you look like a painting from Monet or Picasso we mentioned here, you know, it, when you look at a painting and you look at a work of art, you know that behind that work of art, there is the artist who produced it, right? When you look at the chair that you're sitting in, you know that there was a designer behind this chair that designed it in the first place. And you look at a building where we are, there's somebody drew and designed this building before it came into existence. Same thing happens to everything else on the earth. You look at nature and you see that there is a design in everything in nature. And behind this design, there is a designer. And if the design is perfect, and if you wouldn't add another pair of uh, wings to the chicken, it's because the design is perfect, then imagine the designer. In other words, God is perfect. And you can't improve in perfection. Perfection can't improve. Perfection doesn't change. Perfection, perfection doesn't need to be retouched. So as much as we wouldn't retouch the Mona Lisa, we can also say that God doesn't change. All right, so if God doesn't change, but we can see clearly, oh, God is burning cities here, and he's calming storms here, then what changed? Oh, if God didn't change, that means that we changed. That is the answer. Humanity changed. We change all the time. We are always changing. After World War II, countries got together and created the United Nations. And the United Nations decided to write the human rights, the chart of human rights. Every human, every human being has the right of freedom, uh, right of free speech, right of an education, and so forth. It's the Charter of Human Rights. There were some laws that they decided to agree upon. For example, that um, gas 
deadly gas would never be allowed in wars anymore, no matter what. There's an agreement. If any country ever decides to use poisonous gas in war, all the other countries of the United Nations will come against that country. So there's a war going on with Russia and Ukraine. Neither one side can use lethal gas because it's forbidden by international law. And that only came about recently. Like, this is recent, right? Uh, 1948, 1950s. That shows that humanity is evolving, that we are learning. Things were done in the past that were barbaric and nobody cared, it was okay. Oh, don't have to go very far in history to remember slavery, right? How many of you agree that slavery is barbaric? Unless you have a couple of slaves at home nobody knows about? Having somebody work, force somebody to work for you and they get no pay and they have a chain in their back and if they misbehave, you're allowed to put them in a tree and, and just beat them up because they're your property? Well, today we think it's a, absurd, but just recently in our history, very recently, like if you put a timeline of humanity, this is like a hair. This is just around the corner. It was okay here in North America, in the United States. Everybody knows this. It was okay to have slaves, and they were considered property. And when a slave owner was beating the, his slave, nobody could say anything about it. And they would back it up with the Bible. They would back it up with the Bible because the Bible talks about slavery, right? Now, it's important to notice that God never created slavery. And some people, you know, back in the day, they used the Bible to say, you know, the slave should honor their slave owner. Well, the Bible didn't create slavery. It was just the people who lived with slavery and loved God wrote in the Bible how the slave owner should behave and how the slave should behave because it was an existing situation already. But the Bible never condoled it. It wasn't God who created slavery, it was men. Slavery was created by men. And so very, very close, like I'm talking 100 years ago, 200 years ago, my grandfather, the father of my father, was a black man in Brazil. Brazil was one of the greatest importers of slaves from the Europeans. European ships would bring slaves to Brazil to work with the sugarcane and coffee fields that were abundant. And they would export the tobacco, coffee, and sugarcane to Europe. And they would do it with slave labor. So they would go to Africa being, uh, and attack those tribes that could defend themselves, take those guys, and sell them in Brazil. My father's father, um, all is told the story that his father was a slave. So there's my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather was a black slave in Brazil. And he kept the sh one of the shackles as a souvenir. And I had the opportunity to see it. One of my uncles kept it. This belonged to our great-grandfather. In their case, my, in my father's brother's case, their grandfather. So my father's grandfather had a shekel around his foot. And they kept the shekel and the chain. And it was in real good condition too. And I remember looking at that thing and thinking, my goodness, I cannot think of a life where that is on my foot, chained to some place, and I have to go work for somebody for free. Just to have food in my belly. Can you think of that? Not long ago, that was a reality. And then imagine what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus was around. Well, imagine 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago. We're talking about 100 years and how much humanity changed. I mean, the God of the Old Testament is like 10,000 years ago dealing with this barbaric people that thought it was okay and normal to burn their children as offerings to their gods. Did you know that? Yeah. It was very normal for uh, people in, uh, the, in, in the region where God oftentimes, he says, go into that land and he would tell the people of Israel, conquer the land, 
and kill everybody. Basically, in the Bible says to kill every man. Well, first of all, we know that God's not saying killing, to kill everybody in some cases because you would say, but when you marry their women, right after he said, kill everybody, he would say, when you marry their women, you will teach them the ways of the Lord. Well, if you told them to kill everybody, how come they're going to marry their women? So kill everybody means kill every warrior, basically, every man who can hold a sword and fight, right? So we're talking about war. But there are specific cases when God actually says, kill every man, woman, and child. But the reason for that is because of the barbaric culture of these people. It was okay for these people, for example, the Canaanites, it was okay for them. They thought it was normal. Society, everybody did this. There's records in history that entire cities would get together to sacrifice children to their gods. One of their gods is called Moloch. You can Google it, you'll find it. Moloch was a big statue of iron, iron statue, where the belly opened up like a door, and they would put their children in there, bound, hands and feet, and, and close that metal door and set it on fire around, and, and the children would gradually suffocate and die cooked inside the statue. And they're talking dozens of children. And to help the parents cope with the screaming inside, they had huge drums they would play in their ritual. Hundreds of people playing the drums so loud so that they couldn't hear the screaming inside the statue. This is a historical fact. This happened. This is the kind of people God would say, hey, let's, you know, go there, put an end to this. When you see in that perspective, it starts to make sense. Okay, God, but why kill every woman and children in some cases? Well, a lot of times it's because they grew up with that culture. They grew up watching kids be killed like that. Some of these women offered their kids. And if they would remain, stay alive, they would probably bring that habit and keep on the culture. Like, for example, you remember a simple case when Jacob marries uh, Rachel and Leah. Rachel brings Laban's idols with her, false gods. She married Jacob, who worships the only true God. She doesn't know any better. She was raised worshiping false gods. So she brings the, go the gods of her father with her. And some say that's the reason she was barren and couldn't have children. But God, in his mercy, heard Jacob's prayers and gave her children. She had Joseph and Benjamin. But it's so easy for you to keep up a, a, a tradition and keep up a culture, something you've always heard. You grew up with that. It's normal for you. So at times, God could do it. And somebody said to me, but isn't that morally wrong? And how come God tells us to follow a moral law and not kill anybody? Thou shalt not kill. But he tells the people to kill. So basically, he kills, like in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, he kills every woman and, and child in the city. Well, the, the reason is because we are not God. God is not subject to the laws that we are because we are creation. He's the creator. We cannot give life. No matter how much you would like to, you cannot make something dead be alive again. You cannot go to a funeral and give life to the person. Yes, God can use you to raise the dead if he tells you to do it and you obey, and you're bold enough to lay hands on that dead person and command them to live, if God told you to do it, it's going to happen. Amen? Amen? But you, on your own power, cannot go around and, and end, ending funerals by yourself. You don't have the power to give life. You can't put a bunch of clay together, <sighs> blow on it, and boom, here comes a person. Right? You can't do that. God can. Because he is the creator of life, he can end a life. And at the end of the day, we're all going to die. Someday we're all going to go meet with God. And God is the one who decides when your time has come up, right? When your number is called. It's, the Bible says clearly, we all have a number of days assigned on this earth. God assigns you that number of days. He chooses who stays and who goes, right? So if he decides that this entire city has to go now, hey, he's just anticipating the unavoidable. Death is unavoidable. One certainty we have in this life, we're all going to, right? 
with the exception of a couple of you, <laughs> we're all going to die. So when God says just to uh, this person or that person, even an entire city, you're all going to die today. Well, he can because he's the one who gave them life first place. So we have to trust God that he is God, we are not. And when the angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to have a baby, she believes. And that's the first thing that's important that you and I believe in God. When we believe in God, we are working with him. When we doubt God, we are working without him. So Zechariah doubts the angel's message from God and says, how can I know this is real? How can I know this is true? And Mary's answer is, how will this be? In, in what way? And she, she explains to the angel, so the angel understands what she's talking about. Because I'm a virgin, I don't have a husband. So how? You know what I'm saying? How's this going to be? You know what I'm saying? I'm having a hard time deciding when and how I'm going to talk about the birds and the bees with my kids. Because they keep asking me questions. It's getting harder and harder to dodge that bullet. I have to talk to Pastor Jeff because he has already got teenagers. <laughs> By now, his youngest probably knows about the birds and the bees. I don't know. I'm having a hard time. Just to sit, thinking, just the idea, I'm sweating already. <laughs> just to think of the idea of sitting with those little, beautiful little kiddos and explaining that to her. So Mary is having that problem. She goes like, oh, wait a minute. You know, she, Mary is old enough to know how it works. Yeah? You know, how it works. She knows, you know, the pieces of the puzzle and the things that have to come together for it to happen. So she's like, okay, well, there's, a piece, there's a piece missing on this puzzle. I'm ready, but wait a minute. I'm not married. I'm a virgin. So how's, how's this going to be? So she's not questioning the validity of the message. She is so sure of the validity of the message that she wants to know what's the means for it to happen. That shows that Mary believed the promise. And that makes a huge difference. God speaks to us and he gives us promises in a daily basis. God is speaking to you in a daily basis. And the challenge that I have and the challenge that you have, first of all, is to believe that God speaks to you. Isn't it? That's the greatest challenge that we have. First of all, believe that God is speaking to me. Because our tendency is to think, oh, that's just my head. That's just me. This is, this, is, this, is, this is not God. Can't be. Why would God speak to me? And a lot of times that comes from our own insecurity. It comes from this lack of value. It comes from our own uncertainties. A lot of times it's a result of our upbringing. We were not encouraged or valued in our childhood a lot of times. And so we grow up with this um, uncertainty, this doubt, this questioning about our own worth, like our self-worth. A lot of times for a lot of people our self-worth is very low because we, we, we didn't grow up being encouraged, motivated. A lot of us grew up being questioned and doubted all the time. So when God speaks to us, the first thing that we question is, is it really God speaking to me? And that reflects our self-worth. And the way to counteract that imposter syndrome, you know, have you ever heard of the imposter syndrome? You can search it. It's like when you feel like people think of you better than you actually are and you feel like an imposter and it's not true it's rooted again in self-worth you don't have to do anything for God to love and highly value you you don't have to do anything all you have to do for God to love you is to be born that's all you have to do for God to love you for you to deserve God's love all you have to do is to be born. So help me out here. I have this question. Help me clarify this. How many of you were born? Let me see. <laughs> you were born? Okay, so you qualify. If you were born, you qualify to receive God's love. He loves you. Period. Oh, but I don't go to church every day. It doesn't matter. 
Oh, but I don't do this or do that. doesn't matter. What do children do to deserve the love of their mother? I remember the day the doctor picked up Lizzie when she was born. She was screaming. And the doctor pulled, placed her on my arms. And immediately, I felt like my heart was beating inside, outside my chest, inside of that little baby. I loved her. I loved her. And I cried. And Danny and I and Lizzie, the three together, we hugged. And we have a picture. The doctor took a picture for us. And she still had the umbilical cord. She had, she had done nothing to deserve my love. But I couldn't love her more. At the, right at that moment that I first saw her for the very first time, if somebody said, it's either your life or hers, you choose. Somebody's got to die here. I would say, hey, me, right now. Don't have to think about it. It's boom, automatic. I knew that I knew that I knew that I would die for that little baby. And what had she done? Nothing. She was born. That's it. Hey, that's you. You were born. And Father God loves you. And your identity is a child of God. He's a good, good father, like we're saying. And who we are? Who are we? He's a good, good father. And who are we? Loved by him. Good, good father. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. That's your identity. Loved by God. Next time you go someplace and people ask you, you know, they're giving badges away and they're putting the names, people's names to put the badge so everybody knows who's who, you know, and they ask you, what's your name? And who are you? They say, who are you? They say, I'm a child of God. What? Just put, put in the badge, child of God. G-O-D. The child of the big G-O-D. You're loved by God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Point two, agree. Verse 36, if you would join me as we read. Now indeed, Elizabeth has also conceived in her old, and this is now for her who was called. Oh, that's a nice nickname to have, isn't it? Nickname. What's her nickname? Baron. You know Baron? She lives across the street over there, Baron. You know? Wife of Zechariah. Oh, yeah, Baron. She can't have three. How old is she again? Oh, I think she's 75. Oh, wow. What a shame. What a shame to leave this earth and not leave any children behind. <coughs> Baron. That's how her neighbors knew her. Look, verse 37. Let's read together. For God, for, sorry, for with God, Say that again. For with God, nothing. nothing will be impossible. Let's pause there for a second and let, let it sink in. With God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. But here's the catch. You've got to be with God. You've got to be with God. It's not with money, nothing is impossible. That's not what it says. Because you know, and Steve Jobs is going to testify to that. That money doesn't save you from liver cancer. Because he had trillions of it. He was the inventor of Apple iPhone and Apple iPad and all this stuff, Apple. Gazillionaire. With all his money, he could not buy one more day on this earth. With all his money, Steve Jobs died of cancer. So it's not with money all things are possible or nothing is impossible. It's not with friends. With friends, all things are possible or nothing is impossible. No, it's with God. So more than money, more than friends, not more than anything else, we should be seeking to be with God. It's not with happiness. Nothing will be impossible. No, it's not with joy or with a new car or the house paid for. No, even though we want those things, we must want God first. We must want God more. For with God, let's read it together. For with God, nothing will be. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord. 
Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So in other words, Mary's response to the angel's announcement showcases a profound faith. Mary accepted the angel's message with belief and curiosity about how God's promise would be fulfilled. She was not doubting. She was just wanted to know, what is my part? What do I have to do here? You know, how is it going to be? And the angel tells her, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived a child. A famous Bible scholar, I believe you can say recently, though it's, I think it was in the 80s. He was an archaeologist in Jerusalem. And he, he found several interesting artifacts of biblical times, including some of Jeremiah's writings. Jeremiah, Jeremiah is famous for being one of the prophets that was there when the Babylonians, Babylonians invaded Jerusalem. And he was doing some archaeology digs. And the Holy Spirit led him to dig. And he was a spirit-filled man. And the Holy Spirit led him to dig right under the place where Jesus was crucified, in the Golgotha, the place where the crucifixion of Jesus happened. And he, the Holy Spirit told him to dig under that mount. So he went to dig under that mount. And he had all the paperwork from the uh, govern governors, the go government. And he was, you know, doing this dig. And he was, his team was tired, and they all called it a day, but he felt he was supposed to continue. And he went oh, into the night. You know, there was lights in there and everything, all the infrastructure, but he was digging alone. And he found this chamber. And was built, with, uh, there was a wall of rocks. He moved the rocks. And he moved the rocks, he found there was a, a chamber. And he squeezed through the hole and he got into this chamber, which was right under the crucifixion site. And he, and he saw it was a cave that was dug in the rock. And in there, he found something that was covered in, in uh, some kind of uh, material, some, there was some layers, and he removed it. And then, to his astonishment, it was the Ark of the Covenant. You can Google it later, you're going to see it's all there, there's videos about this. He told the story several times. When he uncovered the, the Ark of the Covenant, it was amazing, because we all saw pictures of the Ark of the Covenant, of these two cherubims facing each other with their wings this way, but when he described it and he made a drawing of what he saw, the angels were facing forward with one wing touching each other's wing, the other wing was lowered down, and he formed a seat where one could put his arms to rest on the wings, on the wings of the angels. And the other two wings formed the back of the seat. Nobody has ever described the Ark of the Covenant that way. And he said that he saw uh, some sort of dark stain covering it. And he looked up and he saw there was a big crack on the rock. And the same stain was on top. So he assumed that whatever that was, it dripped on top of the ark. And he took it to the lab to analyze it. And, and as he's excited and he can't wait to tell his colleagues about this finding, two young men appear to him in the chamber. When he turns to leave, there's two young men there, all dressed in white. He said, if I saw them in the marketplace during the day, I would just think they were just two young men with white clothes. There was no light, no glory, nothing. But he said, immediately he trembled inside. His insides start to tremble. Oh, that's not hard to happen, you know. Sometimes you're alone in the house in the middle of the night and you think you see something, you go like this, you're already scared, right? Imagine being in a chamber by yourself in the middle of the night in a cave that you've been digging. Suddenly you turn, there's two young men standing there. So he was afraid. Guess what they said? The first words that they said. Two words. Two words they said. Fear not. 
Hmm, I've heard that before. They said to him, this discovery is for you to tell, but not to show. The exact location of the ark must stay hidden until the time of the Lord. And he said he was trembling. And then they turned, went through the hole, and he went to follow them, and they disappeared. They were gone. This is all they said. And with fear and trembling, he placed the rocks back, covered with dirt, and didn't tell anybody until the right time. When the right time came, he was visited by one of those young men, showed up to him again and said, it's time for you now to tell the authorities so they can take it to a secure location. So he spoke to the authorities of Jerusalem, and the authorities of Jerusalem and Israel came with him and followed biblical scrutiny on how to carry the ark. And he knew he had to do that because David tried to carry the ark on a, on a bogey with a cow. And remember that story? And Uzzah touched the ark and died. So he said, if you want to do this right, we've got to carry it the way the Bible says we're supposed to carry it. Well, the government didn't care much about what he said or what the Bible said because these are not Christian people or Jewish people. or just Israeli government people, right? So they went in there with him because he had to show the location. And despite his direction, they went to carry it just like if it was any other, like a, you carry a chair or a chest. Well, the first person who touched it died instantly. The first soldier, they, they sent a, a, a groupment of the uh, army to go get it. The first soldier that touched it died instantly. They said, what happened? You know, call the paramedics, take him, you know, the resuscitation, bzz, clear, poof, nothing. Guy's gone, dead. All right. Well, that's unfortunate. I'm such a young man to have a heart attack out of the sudden. Let's go. Let's move on with the plan. Second guy who touches it died. They said, whoa, 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 stop. What did you say again about carrying this thing? Yeah, you have to follow the Levitical law that God told Moses. You have to put the poles and carry it properly. And you have to carry, bring somebody of the lineage of the Levites. And so he teaches them what the Bible says, how you're supposed to carry the ark. Now, after two people died, they said, okay, let, just in case, let's do it the way he's saying. So they followed the instruction, carried the ark to a secure location in Israel, where they have it right there, secure. After that event, again, two other people went there and touched it because they wanted to study or whatever. The two of them died. And they went back to him to ask him, why are these people dying? And then he showed them in the Bible the story of Yuza and how David wanted to move the ark. Then finally they brought some Jewish people to, you know, analyze. And you can follow all this story. It's all in the internet. It's in a secure location. Then the Jewish people confirmed this is the ark of the covenant. And they said, we must rebuild the temple of Solomon and reestablish the sacrifice. That's the, their idea. So they wanted to follow the exact instructions in the Bible, and they set up a location in Texas, where it's the best and most appropriate place to raise cattle. And they are raising this specific breed of cow that was demanded by the law of Moses to be sacrificed as in the altar of God. And they have the first cows ready because they found the ark. Now they have the cows. They are setting up the stage. I'm not coming up with this. You can do your research. You're going to find out it's all true. It's all there. They want to reestablish this, this third temple of Solomon because the this, this second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Remember Jesus said, you see all this this beauty, the temple is so beautiful, there won't be any rocks standing on top of each other. It will all be destroyed. Destroy this temple. Remember that? And he compared to his own body. That happened in, in, in 70 AD, 70 years after Christ. And they're going to, their plan is to rebuild the temple. Remember when the, in Revelation it says, when you see the abomination, know that the end is near. Remember that? Some scholars say that the abomination that John is talking about is when they rebuild the temple and they start to, to offer sacrifice again on the altar. Why? Because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. It requires no more sacrifice. His sacrifice is perfect. You don't need to add retouches to the cross. 
You don't need to retouch this beautiful picture that God has painted. The sacrifice of Christ is perfect, but they will try. And that's what God calls an abomination. What does that have to do with Mary? Well, that brings us to number three, surrender. Say with me, surrender. Then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices with God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Mary's surrender to God is beautiful expressed in her song of praise, often called the, Magnif the Magnificat. Her surrender was not passive, but an active, joyful acceptance of God's will for her life. And unfortunately, the Jewish don't accept Christ as their Messiah. They're still waiting for their Messiah. Even though Jesus fulfills every prophecy about the Messiah. But they're expecting a Messiah like King David, a Balak Messiah, a warrior Messiah that will lead their country into victory against their enemies. They're still expecting a messianic leader that will be... Uh, a leader of their armies, like David was. And they're failing to grasp the concept that Jesus came for much more than given us a political victory. He came to give us eternal victory over death. He is the perfect Messiah. Can I hear an amen? amen? So when he took the blood that he found on the altar, on the Ark of the Covenant, remember the blood, the stain? He found out it was blood. He took it to the lab he found out that stain on top of the Ark of the Covenant, it was blood. Why is that important? Well, because when he looked up and he saw the crack, that stain was there too. And he remembered the Bible said that when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake and the rock was shattered. The rock cracked under him. So that crack went all the way down to the Ark of the Covenant. Who put the Ark of the Covenant there in the first place? Jeremiah. When the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, Jeremiah wanted to hide the, the Ark of the Covenant so the Babylonians wouldn't take it. And he dug a hole and he hid it there covered with rock. Of course, him and, and, and a bunch of other men that followed Jeremiah. He was a known and, and f a prophet with many followers. He was in charge of the Ark at the time. So they hid it there. And, uh, and then when Jesus died in, in 33 AD or was 37 AD the, the ground shook and the rock cracked and his blood that was dripping dripped on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Why is that important? Because in the Old Testament when God set up the Ark of the Covenant told Moses to build it, he said the high priest will come and he will sprinkle the blood of the lamb, the innocent lamb, the pure lamb without blemish and he will sprinkle that blood on the Ark of the Covenant and the sins of the people will be forgiven. And that's how we know the ark was real, the real ark, because God had to sprinkle the blood of his perfect lamb on the ark of the covenant to fulfill his promise that the sins will be forgiven. Jesus did the ultimate surrender. He surrendered his own life on the cross. So that his blood could be sprinkled over the Ark of the Covenant for our forgiveness of sins. When he and when, when he did the test on that blood to his astonishment, and the, the lab scientist that was in his team, to their astonish, astonishment, the blood was still alive. The blood was still alive. You know, blood cells, if you take a sample of your blood, put it on the shelf, in three days, it's dead. Blood doesn't live on its own without the human body. It needs the human body to be alive. That blood, they put it under the mi microscope, the blood cells were still alive. Another thing that they found that was amazing, every human being has 24 chromosomes from the mother, 24 chromosomes from the father, 48 chromosomes. That blood had 25 chromosomes. Or correct me if I'm wrong, it's 23 from the father, 23 from the mother. 
But that blood had only, uh, so if it's 24, 24, 48, that blood has only 25, which means 24 chromosomes from Mary and one from Father God. And that makes Jesus 100% man and 100% God. Why, 20, why, why only one chromosome from God? Well, God doesn't need 24. He only needs one. He only needs one. And that's enough to make Jesus walk on water. That's enough. One chromosome from God in his body was enough to make his saliva open the eyes of the blind. You remember when Jesus comes to that blind man and he spits on the ground? And he takes, have you ever taken a swab? Why did they swab your saliva? Because your saliva has your DNA. Your saliva has your chromosomes. When Jesus spits on the ground and takes out that saliva and passes it on the eyes of that man, what is, what is he doing? He's doing the same thing he did in the Garden of Eden. He's making mud. But this time that mud has his chromosome. He carries life, power of life with it. The moment he touches those blind eyes, whatever is missing there is fulfilled and complete. The man washes what happens to him. What happened to the blind man? He could see again. Why? Because Jesus has the divine chromosome in him. He is 100% God. He is 100% man. He is 100% God. And in his perfection, he has chose to die with his arm open, arms open or with open arms. He died with open arms to welcome you into his kingdom. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, it's not about you. Oh, but I sin, I lie, I, I cheat, no matter who you are. All you have to do is accept, accept this beautiful free gift of life and walk with him. He could have died with his arms crossed. He could have died in a crumble. He could have died in so many different ways. He could have died burned. But it was God's plan for him to die with open arms, welcoming you and me, welcoming us into the kingdom of God. And that man who was crucified next to him was an outlaw, a murderer, deserved by his own mouth. He declared, I deserve to die here. Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus said, surely, surely, I tell you that today, you will be with me where? That thief didn't have time to repent. That thief didn't have, I mean, he had time to repent. He didn't have time to go to church to repent. He didn't have time to raise his hand in a sermon. Somebody asked me, Pastor Ed, why do you never make an altar call and have people raise their hand and come to the front? Because I don't think that gives anybody salvation. What well, gives you salvation is a change of heart. He couldn't raise his hands. His hands were nailed to the cross. He couldn't go up the altar to, to answer the altar. Oh, Jesus, can you give me another week of life so I can go to church on Sunday, raise my pierced hand, and, and answer to the altar call? An altar call was invented by D.L. Moody in the 1800s, 1,800 years after Christ. What happened to all the people that got saved between Jesus' death in the 1800s who didn't answer an altar call? The, the altar call happens here. The altar is your heart. This is the real altar. This is where we repent. This is where we change. And this is where we accept his invitation. And we accept his embrace. Would you like to accept his embrace this morning? Can you say amen? amen. Let's stand up and let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blood that was shed for us. You went through the cracks of the earth, healing the earth, healing the ground as it touched it, healing the earth that was under the curse of sin and death, and you healed. The blood went through the earth, through the cracks, and healed the earth, and it dripped on top of the altar of the covenant, of the Ark of the Covenant, as it was spoken to Moses, and the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled over the altar of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, releasing forgiveness to all those who believe. And this morning, we want to declare, we believe. We believe, Jesus, and we receive you, Jesus, once again, as our Lord and Savior. Forgive us our sins and our debts. Give us the gift of the Holy Spirit and lead us 
not into temptation, but lead us into a life of obedience and surrender to you. Let us learn from the example of Mary. For when, he heard, when she heard the message from the angel, she believed. She agreed. And she surrendered. Let us also believe. Let us also agree with you. And let us also surrender to your plans. Even when we don't understand them, we want to surrender. Even when we doubt, we want to ask you, forgive us and help us believe. Change our doubt into faith so that like Zechariah, when we see the promise of the baby, we can also sing of joy and praise your name like he did when he received back his voice. And he praised your name, God. But help us be like Mary. Help us not doubt. Help us believe Agree and surrender so that we can have the good and perfect will of God manifest in every area of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.